field zoologist Tim Flannery is in a league with the world's great explorers. He's discovered more species than Charles Darwin, and of course, he studied Darwin, worms and all. He has taught evolutionary biology, presented documentaries on many heady subjects. He joins us today to talk about how life emerged and how we can sustain it on this Earth. He tells the story of this planet in his new book, Here on Earth, A Natural History of the Planet. It is my pleasure to welcome Tim Flannery to Studio 4 to tell us more. A pleasure to meet you. You too, Fanny. It's great to be here. You know, one of the gifts of writing is that you learn things. When you put this one together here on Earth, what did you learn that you didn't know about us and the species and our future? Wow. Well, the book took five years to write and research. And um, I guess I came away with it from it with a much more optimistic view of the human future than I went in. I, was, I wrote the book because I was kind of concerned about our, the state of our future. Were we going to overcome these challenges that we faced? Was evolution on our side? Uh, and I found, in fact, I think evolution has just slightly rigged the dice in our favour. You know, we are tremendously social uh, beings. We have this sense of empathy with each other and with the planet. And we are now building a global superorganism, a global civilization that I think uh, can work for the good in the planet, planetary system. Why is evolution, or the theory of evolution, yeah. or Darwin's theory, I, I'm assuming Darwin, or yeah. would it be Wallace? Both together, both said the same thing. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, on our side. It's on our side because although it's a really ruthless process, that evolutionary theory, and mm. you can think about it as, as leading it to a survival of the fittest type world, uh, th that's not right. You know, in fact, what that ruthless mechanism has done is created an immensely cooperative world where uh, every little bit of the planet is connected with every other little bit and interdependent. And you, know, you can take our bodies as an example of that. 10% you know, of the things I think of as us is not really me. I mean, on my skin, I've got hundreds of species of bacteria and fungus, no matter how much I wash, you know, and I can't mm. live without them. So we are ecosystems of plan planetary complexity ourselves. So those links between species and across ecosystems are what evolution has built, and they're central to our survival. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, we are complex, and yeah. the planet is complex, and we sit around in our air-conditioned homes, I think you said it, yeah. uh, eating, drinking, making merry, <laughs> spending, spending, spending. Sure, We're consumer yeah. mad. We have too many children, perhaps. Yeah. And all of that's true, um, but if you look at the big picture over the long term, you can see that we are um, changing, and that the, the, the having too many children is a great example. You know, by 2050, the world population will have peaked, even though it's at a very high level, and will then start to decline. That means we're self-regulating as a species in terms of our numbers. That's really, really mm. important. In terms of food security, sure, we've, we are now really playing a game of brinksmanship with those sort of things, energy and food security. But you can see hope in some of the new trends uh, globally in terms of more sustainable food production and renewable energy that I think are going to play a big role in our future. Water? Huge issue, particularly in places like Australia, my country, mm -hmm. you know. Um, uh, but we, again, we are getting better at using it. And, and there, there is hope where there's enormous reforms underway in Australia at the moment about the use of water, which, if they're successful, will really lay the foundation for a sustainable agricultural base in, in the country. Give me an example. Well, we have over-allocated our river systems in Australia to mm -hmm. the point where they no longer flow to the sea. It's been a catastrophe. And it's been, that's happened because each state has had carriage of responsibility for water and they can't cooperate. So the federal government's taken that responsibility off them and then instituted a water plan to buy back all of the over-allocated water um, and create a sustainable river system where there's enough water for the environment as well as enough for sustainable agriculture. And that's going to come about through efficiency, so people aren't going to be just flooding their fields anymore. They're going to be using drip irrigation and so forth. And, and an overall water market, so people can buy and sell water and it goes to the most efficient user. Mm -hmm. and, but as you know, people are, are damming streams and rivers and putting power projects into beautiful, pristine rivers yeah, yeah. so that we can have heat and light sure. and things like that. That's right. yeah, yeah. They, call, they call it greening. Yeah. Not sure if it is. Yeah. Well, look, I, that's all true, and I don't want to paint too rosy a picture on this because mm -hmm. we are still in a critical period of time. This next decade and, and the next 40 years are going to be really critical. But all I'm saying is that underneath all of that, we are slowly learning how to work together to deal with really serious environmental problems. Climate change is a great example. You know, it's, it's, it's slow, but we are making progress. 
the Copenhagen Accord is a very important document and it gets us two-thirds of the way we need to get to to avoid dangerous climate change. Well, well, you know about that because you were chair of the Copenhagen Climate Council, as I recall. That's right, for three years up to the Copenhagen mm. meeting, yeah. So where do we stand, this country, Canada, yeah. on the world's uh, scale, our commitment to the environment, mm. Look, uh, sadly, stopping man-made climate change. Yeah, yeah. Sadly, in the international forums, Canada has lost that tremendous position it had a decade or so ago, where mm. it was a world leader. It now is increasingly isolated on on the world stage in terms of where it's, it stands uh, in 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 those forums, and and that's a very sad thing um, because what you see globally is the world is moving forward quite quickly. Uh, places like China, even India. Mm -hmm. and, and my own country of Australia, are now moving forward to grab their bit of the new energy economy. So it's not just yes. about combating climate change, it's about new economic opportunity. The growth economies and the need. Uh, yeah. And as China becomes more and more and more successful and richer, yeah, yeah, yeah. aren't they going to want what we have? Absolutely, of course they are. And they know they can't do it using a fossil fuel base. It's simply too polluting and too expensive. So they are going ahead with major investments in renewable energy, you know, wind, solar, even new nuclear. Um, to build that that new energy economy, and every country that, that 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 participates in that is going to have a stake in that future, and and that's what my country of Australia is trying to do. We're very fossil fuel dependent in my country, we're the world's biggest coal exporter, but we are moving through a number of mechanisms to try to grab our piece of that new energy market. And you are for nuclear energy, against depends. Uh, look, I. I can see it, 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 it's inevitably going to expand. At places like China where there are so few energy options and there's enormous populations, they're committed to a big new build in, in nuclear. So whatever you think of it, it's going to be part of the enemy, energy mix into the future. Mm -hmm. I hope 30 or 40 years from now we'll have other options, but at the moment there's, there's not enough options uh, to, to exclude nuclear in places like China. Do you think, going back to one of your basic premises, that we're genetically programmed to destroy at will? No, I don't, actually. I don't. That's really a misreading of things. Okay. That's going back to those old Darwinian ideas that we live in a survival of the fittest world. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world and we've got to grab what we can now, otherwise someone's going to grab it from us, you know. That's just not the way the world works. Uh, there are, however, um, I, can, I, can I call them innovators? Uh, perhaps somebody uh, uh, thinking about uh, an atomic bomb kind of mining yeah, <laughs> under yeah. the tar sands. Well, and when we sit in our living room, we think, that sure. doesn't sound good. <laughs> I don't know how it's going to work, but somehow I don't think that's a good thing to do. Well, you know that that it was actually proposed in, in the mm -hmm. 1960s. The, the Richfield Oil Company wanted to use nuclear weapons up in the tar sands to, to, as a form of mining. Yes. And thank heaven some Canadian politicians sort of thought about this. And <laughs> <laughs> it it might have worked technically, mm -hmm. but were they going to be able to sell it to the Canadian people? Maybe thank not. Heavens they did. It's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. But yeah. no longer do we have DDT and other things, yeah. as you know, and some people that's say right. that's not so good because we have more malaria, but if we kept using DDT, then... That argument is so wrong because yeah. DDT is still being used in developing countries for malaria control, and that's fine. We know there's a cost to all of these things, but you, you, know, you have to take a balanced approach to this. There's a lot more dangerous chemicals in our environment uh, than DDT, and they are being regulated globally under a new treaty, the, the, the Stockholm Convention. Dangerous chemicals like PCBs? Anything that accumulates in your body and my body. Mm. These are the, called the persistent organic pollutants. The second they're made, we know they're going to end up in our bodies, and there's no choice but to, to ban those. And the treaty that bans them calls for an immediate cessation of production. Um, but also a transfer of wealth from the richest countries to the poorest to assist with that mm. because these things are so dangerous. Mm -hmm. We know that if they're manufactured, they're going to end up in our body uh, and, and are, are just they're going to destroy our health. And cause disease. Uh, they're doing the links now, as you know. Yeah, too yeah. much of this and too much of that. Uh, perhaps is it epigenetics or yeah, there's yeah. fancy words for it. Sure, yeah, yeah. But all of those things, you know, um, because they, they tend to accumulate in our body and they'll end up millions of times more concentrated in us than in the environment outside, uh, they, are, they are dangerous. And as you say, they cause all sorts of uh, medical problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have two, uh, well, hypotheses in yeah. the book. One's called the Median Hypotheses and the Gaia Hypothesis. Yeah. I'll get it right. right. When we come back, can you explain those? Sure. What yeah. it all means? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Tim Flannery, our guest here on Earth, a natural history of the planet.